You are listening to the Final Say Radio Show, a Rappaport Media production, with your host Brett Rappaport and co-host John Rappaport. You know, folks, we have our Congressman Steve King from Iowa calling in, so I'm going to bring him into the conversation, and I want to welcome back to the Final Say Radio Show, Congressman King. It's a pleasure to have you. It's good to be back on. Thanks for having me. Oh, well, thank you very much, and I've been discussing all types of issues uh, so far in the program today, and uh, right now I'm looking and breaking down the unemployment report, and I know we're not going to spend too much time on this, but I think you would agree that there there are a couple things, well, I mean, there are numerous things that have an impact on the, I, I call them sorry jobs reports that we've been having, but I think Obamacare has for quite a while been having an impact in in numerous ways. I think companies aren't hiring as much as they may have, and I think employees' hours are being reduced, and I think the willingness to invest in a lot of areas is also being reduced as a result of legislation, not just Obamacare, but similar bills as well. What do you think? Well, I certainly think that's true. And, you know, I listened to a presentation by Steve Moore, one of our top economists in the country uh, here over on a retreat that I just came back from. And, uh, you know, he said that there's at least $2 trillion of capital that's sitting there at U.S. businesses that's not invested. Uh, it might be in bonds that's just sitting there at the very low, re- very low return on interest rates because they are hesitant. And the business doesn't, doesn't have confidence that this government is going to get out of the way. They're watching as more and more regulations stack up every day. And they, that's something that affects jobs. But on top of that, you know, think of the entrepreneurs and the potential entrepreneurs I remember when I started my construction business in 1975, and we're in the second generation now of King Construction, and that my biggest fear was how do I deal with all the government regulations? And, you know, I look back on that now, and I, it was, that sounds ludicrous to say that in 2014, that I feared government regulations in 1975, and it was actually was the, it was the biggest impediment restraint for me to make a decision to launch a business. And so today, the impediments are much, much greater. And the climate in this country, the business climate, is so much more negative. When you think of a, uh, well, Obamacare itself and, and what that does, you start a business and you think, hey, here they come. If I get to over 50 employees, they're going to bring the regulations. But regardless, I've got to buy the insurance myself, and I've got to keep the cash flow going to pay a, 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 a heightened premium dollar with less deductibility. The uh, the unemployment numbers that are out there, even though we've seen our numbers go, the unemployment rate go down. I think that number was 6.7 percent. Uh, it doesn't. They, they, we are still up there with. I mean, by the the number of unemployed are 10.2 million. So that's gone down a couple of million over the last year. That's a that's a good number when you look at it on its surface. But the fact of it is, is that we still have over 100 million Americans of working age that are not in the workforce, and we're still listening to uh, all Democrats that I know of and Republican leadership say, well, we can make our economy better if we just legalize the people that are here illegally because they'll do work that Americans won't do. I know why Americans aren't doing that work, because we have 80 different means-tested federal welfare programs that pay them not to do that work. That's really the bottom line, in my opinion, Brett. Uh, no, well, well said. And I just want to say this: uh, I, I love uh, Stephen uh, Moore, and uh, I know he's with the Heritage Foundation that right now. Uh, just joined yeah. them recently, and I, I think that's great. And I'm, I'm laughing because I, somewhere on my floor, within a few feet of me, is his uh, one of his newer books. And I just I, I had thumbed through it when I interviewed him a uh, month, month uh, probably about six eight months ago. But I was starting to go back through it, and I, I read a lot of his work, and I agree with a lot of what he says. Now, I want to get back to some things that you've been working on, and I, I have to say that you know one of the reasons we love to have you on the program is because we want to like and appreciate the work that you're doing there, not just for Iowa, but what you do in Washington. And I, I've, you know, I always follow your press releases and op-eds and things of that nature. And you have a few recent ones that I'd really love to discuss with you in a little greater length because I think they're very important, and I think you, you've made some you know, exceptional points. Now, you have an op-ed here specifically on uh, accepting Democrats' false immigration premises will lead to the mm-hmm. wrong solution, and, and this was in the Washington Times. And uh, you, you were spot on on so many of these issues. And, uh, you know, it's funny to me because I, I what bothers me and I think what bothers so many Americans with what happens in Washington, D.C., 
is that often people say one thing, but they're doing something else. And so when the language is continuously stated as you only have 11 million people here, that's the new number, and you've pointed out, well, we had 12 million back in 2002, so how could it only be 11 when we know we've you know, had millions more come in? And so, okay, we could argue all day long what the real number is, but we're not being truthful with that. And then one other thing that you raised, and then I'll let you comment on this and, and so much more, but well, – We must fix our broken immigration system, and that is great. I love that you wrote that because it's not the system that's broken, and you have said this so many times. We are not following our laws, and this president isn't specifically. Well, that's that's certainly true. And both of those uh, false premises that have have been rolling around here, they just keep regurgitating them. And and, uh, if we don't challenge them, then it gets in people's minds. And it falls into what uh, Milton Friedman uh, described as the the tyranny of the status quo. And so they're established by these false premises, which I've listed 13 of them in that op-ed, that the tyranny of the status quo creeps into our minds. If we don't question and challenge those false premises, then then we have to we we also have to do our calculations on where what we do and how we go forward based upon false premises. Uh, so population growth, um, you know, I've, you know, I've watched the I've watched the traffic go over the border. I sat down there at night in the dark and and uh, listen as the vehicles come down through the mesquite and people get out and they come across. You hear the what little fence there is creak and squeak and see the shadows and. If I can go down there on any night and see that, and it's not very safe, by the way, uh, and we hear the Border Patrol testify that they think they stopped perhaps 25% of the attempts that crossed the border, and uh, they tell us that they've entered, the number that they've interdicted turns out to be over a million a year, well, then that's 4 million attempts, and that means 3 million got through according to their testimony, and, you know, some of them will pass away in the United States. That's a fact of the data, a fact of, of human living. Uh, some will go back home, but they don't, they don't all go back home. So how does this number not grow? And that's that's just that's one of the pieces that we're dealing with here. And another way to measure this is that they're giving us numbers on now that they say that's you know roughly a static number of le- illegal immigrants in America. And so if it's reducing, and that's actually where their numbers say it's going from 12 million down to 11.6 or five or whatever the number of the day happens to be, well then that's the direction we want it to go. And if it's going towards zero, then we don't have a problem that we need to fix. And, of course, I don't think that's the case, but that's using their argument against them, and that's why I put that in there in that way, Brett. Right. Now, here's something I want to throw into the, the, the immigration issue because, you know, I try to look at things, especially on a federal government level, as is it an issue of national security or something that the states can't handle themselves? And in this case, and I'm only bringing this up because I have – quite a few friends who are teachers in and around New Jersey and some other states, and I've noticed a lot more posting of the concern of how many of their current and past and, and you know former students are dying from things such as heroin overdoses and, and, and things of that nature, which is incredibly sad. But how does heroin come into our country? How do these drugs like that come into our country? But even more important, how about things that can cause significant damage such as taking out one of our cities like a, a, you know a nuclear weapon or, or a weapon of mass destruction and i think that's why we are really so concerned about our borders that there are significant things as we saw on 911 that could happen and we need to defend and protect our people and you can't do that when you have open and porous borders and you completely ignore it you can and, and right, i just see the report here uh, yesterday that there were they found four more heads that had been severed from bodies in Mexico. But uh, people should know some of these macro statistics that you don't get bandied about, don't get admitted to by leftists or even Republican leadership. And, and that is that uh, this is according to the, the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, and it's their job to know 80 to 90 percent of the illegal drugs consumed in America come from or through Mexico. And so if you think of that, it's just to take that number to 90 percent, I think nine out of ten, um, uh, nine, 90 percent of the drugs coming across our Mexican border, well, what would you do if you wanted to dramatically slow down the drugs coming into America? You would secure the border. And you see the, the, the death on campus from heroin, the, the uh, 
lethargy that comes from all of the marijuana abuse. You've seen how all that more marijuana pouring across the border has broken down their respect for our rule of law to the point where marijuana is being legalized in several states across the country. Um, that's, that would not have happened if we had secured our borders and enforced our laws. Our culture would be stronger and more sound. And the serious drugs, and the, the, the more serious drugs, they're all serious, um, such as meth and then heroin, are, are directly killing people. And uh, the actor who was found with a needle in his arm, and I'm not one who watches a lot of movies, but I saw the pieces of the news of that. Another, there's another incident um, on the border, I believe it was McAllen, where a 16-year-old was uh, sneaking into the United States, got caught with liquid meth in his possession, tried to convince the Customs Border Protection people that it was just orange juice, so he drank it, and it killed him. Um, <laughs> That's and we're finding more dead bodies in the desert, not less. And we're introducing about an equal number of drugs as we long have, but the quality of those drugs has gone up and the price has gone marginally down. So we're not tightening our measure. And if you want to measure how whether we're tightening our border, we can't look at the Obama administration's numbers for how many people they deport. They say they would deport more than ever before. That what they're doing is they're counting the voluntary returns, those that are turned back at the border, as deportations. That's never been done before under any administration. So those are phony numbers, but look at the, those that we find that died in the desert and the amount of drugs interdicted, and that'll tell you that the borders as porous as it's been. There probably aren't as many border attempts because the economy has equalized some. So it is a serious thing, and um, we also have the label of persons of interest from nations of interest, which is a, a government euphemism for people from terrorist countries that we are afraid of. And uh, those, when, when they are interdicted on our border, Border Patrol, or CBP, is required to turn them over ICE, to turn them over to the FBI immediately. And as soon as they go into ICE's custody, then that becomes a classified incident. We don't know about that. The public doesn't know, and I only know some. And while I've been down there, at times I've been down there, I've learned of seven uh, individuals, different circumstances each one, persons of interest of, from nations of interest. And I found out about that because I was there in that shift to find out from the Border Patrol that they had picked up an individual that fit that category. Otherwise, we don't know and we don't even find about, out about that in hearings here before the United States Congress. So, yes, we should be concerned and we don't have an administration that is concerned. And we can only count on the president to do that, which is in his political interest and not much else. Yeah, very, very well said. And I, I, I think this is an issue that we should all be working on together. And I, I could just put it this way. Any, any time you see a 13, 14, 15-year-old kid or anyone else for that matter that is hooked on heroin or anything like that at such a young age, their lives are often destroyed if they don't die. And that's, a, that's a, almost a permanent cost on society. We have to – the police force, the legal system, rehab centers, the hospitals, everyone, their, their families – Everybody has to deal with these individuals, and it's a cost to all of us as opposed to somebody being a productive member of society. So I, I think it's a win for, win for all of us, both parties, all part, anyone, whatever you think. I don't see how you could stand against wanting to deal with these issues. And quite frankly, I think not dealing with the most important areas of immigration, which I think are, are the, the border security, it is a complete failure. Well, it, and it, because we lack the will, and because there's mm -hmm. a political reward for the other party in particular. Yeah. And so, I guess. but but I I should say you know, to your listeners that we made some progress in last week and well during there during this week, when uh, Republican House members went on up to Cambridge, Maryland, and had a retreat up there to set the agenda for the legislative year of 2014, and uh, all of the build up for several weeks in advance was that the speaker was going to release his principles for immigration, which, of course, we know was uh, whatever forms of amnesty. And uh, as we, of course, we've been, we build up to that. We've had a number of meetings that uh, host a breakfast every Wednesday morning. It often takes up the immigration issue. We have conservative speakers that come in, uh, Sean Hannity, a week ago Wednesday, Scott Rasmussen just this past Wednesday. That would be the, the two most recent. And uh, the, the message and the dialogue went out across the country and the rule of law uh, organizations such as Numbers USA, FAIR, uh, CIS, uh, went to work, and a lot of the pundits began to write. And as that message went out, members of Congress were picking up these pieces of the thoughts of 
of the commentators and the and the pundits, uh, as well as people inside the Congress and and outside. And it built a it built a resistance. And when those principles were were rolled out and handed to us inside that room at Cambridge, um, we took a look at them and we weren't very uh, very pleased with what we saw. I had I got it leaked to me from a left wing website is where I got the information first. Even though I was sitting in the meeting where they said this is closed door and it's not going outside this room. Well, we've got it from outside the room, from the left wing website. So you kind of know who was negotiating with whom on that language. Uh, but in the end, uh, I read through it, and it looked to me that the Senate Gang of Eight bill would fit well with it, the principles that were delivered by the Speaker on immigration. And, of course, we rejected that. And the news since then is that the House rejects the Speaker's proposal on, uh, I'll call it amnesty, because that's what it is. And uh, so far now, we've slowed this thing down, but I would say we still got a man in watchtowers. It's not going to be easy. We still have to hold our ground. Yeah, well, I agree with you, and quite frankly, I think that there are issues that are so much more important. Uh, the economy, I think, is first and foremost, and when you look at the polls, the American people are saying that in a significant uh, polling rate. So I, I think immigration is far down the list of what people think it needs to be addressed right now. Now, yeah, it, even, it even showed up below the, 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 the category something else in one of the polls. <laughs> <laughs> so none of the above beat immigration in a priority list. Is, and that's, that should tell them something, I would think. That, absolutely. Now, now this is near and dear to you as well, and it has a, a great impact on the people that you represent in um, uh, Iowa. And this is a, a comments that you submitted to the EPA uh, with regards to the RFS, and uh, th this uh, is dealing with the um, the uh, uh, ethanol plants. I'm sorry, the uh, ethanol and the uh, requirements by the uh, federal government. And now ethanol has had a significant impact in your state and, and the people that you represent. And I'd like you to share with us. A little bit of – first of all, I think it was very interesting, but I'd like you to educate us, if you will, on some of the good things that have happened in Iowa and, and why having these standards is not just good for Iowa, but has been good for the, the country as well. Well, thanks, Brad. Uh, you know, uh, just a, a quick piece of history on this is that back in the 70s, uh, when some of this was beginning, the large industry like ADM and Cargill wasn't interested in developing a market or an industry to produce an alternative fuel. Uh, at the time, petroleum had a 100% lock on the market. You might call it a petroleum mandate. And then we had, um, then, then the Jimmy Carter administration said to farmers, we want you to plant fence row to fence row, raise all of the grain that you can raise, farm everything you can farm, and we're going to ship that overseas and export it. Uh, we need that for our economy, and they need the food. And so our farmers took out even some of the fence rows and farmed everything. Uh, everything that you know within reason, and I've been involved in soil conservation all my life, so that's what, that's the limiting reason is make sure we're careful with our soil. In any case, mm -hmm. the Russians invaded Afghanistan. Jimmy Carter forbid our Olympic team to go perform in Moscow, and it'd be embargoed grain. When that happened, all that grain that we'd produced had no market, and we went into a farm crisis, and in, in that was launched in about 1979 or early 80, and it lasted the whole decade. Um, we saw land prices spiral downward to less than half of what they were. You could not get out of a downward spiral. It was a very sad and sick time that put a knot in my gut for three and a half years. We made it through. Some of my neighbors didn't. And But in any case, I say this because the markets can go up dramatically and they can go down dramatically. And in each one of those cycles that are there, it's always, well, it kind of reminds me of the, the Garth Brooks song, the one the wolves pulled down. They are, the the weakest among us will fall to the cycles in the marketplace, and so we got to have a farm program that is going to stabilize those markets so that the weak can get stronger and new people can start, and that's the that's the essence of it. Or if you want to just cut right to the quick on it, it is we can't afford to have all of our farmers go broke in the same year, and the result of that would be that mega corporations would own the land and vertically integrate, and then they control food prices. So um, we decided in the late 70s, but into the 80s, let's build an industry. And uh, we need to find a better way to market this thing we do well, which is raise corn. Let's convert it to ethanol. We had a fuel crisis then, if you remember, gas lines in 79, for example. And uh, so we built an industry, and part of that requirement was 
market access. The petroleum industry was not going to let us blend ethanol into gasoline, and and that was the only way you could get it through the nozzle and into a tank and, and uh, be able to sell it. So we had to have rules changed at the federal level in order to provide the market access. Um, we got that done, and it turned into the renewable fuel standard, which uh, sets the amount of ethanol, amount of renewable fuel altogether, biodiesel too, that needs to be blended with our gas market each year. It's not a subsidy, but it's a re- it's a requirement that it be blended. And uh, that number was at, let's see, 13.64 billion gallons of ethanol to be blended uh, this let's see blended this year, and the number was to be ratcheted up to I think 14.4 billion next year. The EPA just took it down to 13.01 billion gallons, sent a chilling message to the industry. That capital investment that's out there now is kind of hanging out there wondering, are they going to keep pulling their rug out from underneath? And the, in the petroleum industry, um, and I'm, I'm for all energy all the time. I'm not an anti-petroleum guy. You won't hear me use the pejorative term big oil in that way. Um, I, I want them to succeed, too. And they've done some tremendous things in the marketplace, but they don't want to have ethanol going through the pumps and the, and the stations that they control. And so they will come after ethanol and try to squeeze it out of the marketplace because they don't want the competition. And so to give you a sense, um, up until this year, these are last year numbers, 24% of the gallons that go into gas-burning vehicles on our roads in America, the the domestically produced, 24% of the domestically produced gas comes from ethanol. And so it, it has been, it's another market. It keeps gas prices down. It gives us energy security, and it keeps us safer from the the risks that go along with the wars that come from business and foreign oil. So that's a pretty long story through a you know a great big topic, but in the end, it is. Uh, oh, and by the way, the uh, because because ethanol, uh, corn-based ethanol has has kept our grain prices up there. Livestock producers have generally adapted to that. And but but also it has because of the higher grain prices, then it has almost eliminated the call for farm subsidies on on uh, to stabilize our grain prices. And there was a time I had that equation memorized in my head. Um, if they if they want to argue that ethanol pushed grain prices up, then they also have to accept the argument that it eliminated farm subsidies in the process. And by the way, we formally did did that with direct payments in this last farm bill that the president just signed. We eliminated direct payments. So we're making progress in the right direction to get a more free market, but still uh, have, a, have a stabilizing influence there so that the spikes in the marketplace don't pull the weak ones out from underneath us and we can keep the family operations going. Yeah, there, there was another, I thought, really important point that you made in that letter, and that's that American capital was invested in risk as a result of a promise that the production of ethanol and biofuels through the RFS should be, you know, be at a certain level in future years. And I think that's very important for people to hear because when the federal government gives a long-term projection and a plan, businesses act accordingly. And that's our, our biggest complaint about Obamacare. Nobody knows what's going on because they're still writing rules or making them up as they go along or, defer, or saying, no, we, we, we surrender, we give up on this, we'll put a waiver for till next year. And you can't operate business like that. You certainly can't run industries like that. And I thought that was an excellent point. Well, Brett, a deal's a deal. That's really what it comes down to. And you yeah. know, I spent most of my life, uh, 28 years, as a businessman and an employer, and, and we've done thousands of contracts over that period of time. And some of them are real small, maybe for two, three hours of work, and others are long, might be a whole season. Uh, a few of them we actually use ink and signed our names to. Most of them. We didn't even seal with a handshake because where I come from, if you insist on shaking hands on a deal, they might take it as an insult that you don't trust them. And so it's a big thing different than the federal government. But um, but it is this, that when, when you give your word to someone and they agree that they're going to perform that contract, that means they're going to have they're going to, first you invest your trust, then your time, then your capital, and you produce that product. And if on the other end of that they don't hold up uh, hold up their part of it, they broke in the contract. And what I've learned is, and my oldest son owns our business today and is doing well at it, is that over the years I often wanted to work with somebody that worked a little cheaper because I thought I could find a little margin of profit in that 
maybe a subcontractor, a supplier with a little bit of price, and you always want to look for that. But it, but still, in the end, you, we learned over the years you can just cannot do business with people that you can't trust. Eventually, they will get you, and you're better off to work with trustworthy people. The most competitive price of the people that are reliable is what you need to do, and government needs to be a reliable partner, and they aren't. Boy, do, do you have time for one more? I can do one more, fairly short one, Brett. Uh, okay, because you, you said trust, and I'm reading an article. This has to do with Iran, because I'm not thrilled with the the administration's negotiations with Iran and roll, try, you know willing to roll back sanctions and give them more time, I think is a mistake. And this article is talking about Iranian warships heading towards U.S. maritime borders. Now, I know these are just a couple small uh, Iranian vessels, but they are making a point and almost punching us in the face while we're going on these negotiations that, you know, you're you're giving in to us and we're showing our increased power. But he, he, to me, I, I think that's offensive. I, I, I don't understand what this uh, administration is doing with regards to Iran, and I, I think this is, as foreign policy goes, an absolute failure. Well, all, all over the Middle East, we've had a failure of foreign policy, and I, I appreciate your remarks. I think that you see it for what it is, and you describe it as what it is. Um, I just, um, right before Christmas, I came back from a, a trip that we took. Um, it was uh, Michelle Bachman, Louis Gomer, myself, Robert Pitcher, North Carolina. Um, we kind of met and matched, but generally, here's we went to went to Egypt and uh, met with their leadership there. And then went up to, to Lebanon and to Beirut and met with their leadership there. And then down into Libya did the same thing. And then over to Israel did the same thing. And then back through a couple other spots. Um, that's the second round through that part of the world in the last several months for me. And, uh, for example, in Egypt, they will, the people on the ground there that we've known for some time, that are a pretty good barometer, they will just say that the Obama administration's foreign policy has severed 98% of the U.S. relationship with Egypt, which is Egypt is critical to any any kind of a any kind of a peace and stability in the Middle East. They're the they're the big one in a bunch, and uh, you know, Libya is a is a static situation. The civil war is not resolved. The government of Libya can't operate in Benghazi, but the terrorists from Benghazi can operate occasionally in Tripoli. And then uh, you've got then Lebanon, Beirut's a mess. Uh, the Iranian situation, the idea that President Obama, as a, uh, you know, he said to Ahmadinejad, um, if you'll just unclench your fist, we'll extend our hand. Well, I didn't notice that they unclenched their fist, but we had secret negotiations going on between the Obama administration and the mullahs in Iran. And we find out that the president's cut a deal, and then after he cuts the deal, he, he wants to reduce the sanctions. And you're seeing Democrats rise up in the House and Senate against the president's initiative on that. I think it's put Israel in a very bad spot, uh, sitting in uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's office and, and uh, we're just, just watching him and listening to the response to the comments that we had. He's in a very difficult position. Israel may have to decide whether they're going to go in and knock out an nuclear capable Iran. And if that's the case, that could be what starts a, a large Middle Eastern war. They may have to do it out of survival. And yeah. that's because of weak diplomacy, and the lack of vision on the part of this administration, and the idea that you just don't seem to know or understand that Iran has a motive that's long been to develop nuclear. You're not going to talk them out of it when you give them, when you open up the sanctions, which was at least slowing them down, and then they turn around and they clinch their fist at us and sail a couple of ships towards the, uh, you know, towards U.S. operations. That's that is it's defiant and it tells you. They are they they it was they are on the on their tactical path in these negotiations. This benefits them um, to slow down their nuclear operations a little bit. But they're two to three months from a nuclear weapon. They just all they have to do is decide they're going to kick some inspectors out and accelerate their operations, and that's where it is. So, I'm uh, we need a lot stronger president that knows and understands foreign policy. And I will say candidly that. I'm not seeing uh, a lot of foreign policy experts emerge in the Republican side, and that troubles me. And I challenge them: uh, get up to speed, and uh, let's let's have a let's have a president that has good foreign policy experience. And it's too bad we have to wait till 2016. 
Oh, I, I agree with you on absolutely everything you just said. Congressman Steve King, thank you so much for spending so much time with us today. And I just want to give your website so people can go check out some of the things that we've discussed here, uh, steveking.house.gov. Again, thank you so much. Thanks, thanks for having me on, Brett. We'll catch okay. you another time. I appreciate it. Sure. Good luck. Good God bye. bless. Thanks. Goodbye. Well, ladies and gentlemen, again, Congressman Steve King from Iowa. I believe that's the 4th District. And uh, great stuff as always uh, and very interesting.